The question isn't, can you be good without believing in God? The question is, can you be good without God? Oh, William Lane Craig, it seems you got even the question wrong this time. Welcome to Apologia and our continuing series looking at William Lane Craig's Proof for God animated video series. If you want to keep challenging yourself in a pursuit of truth, tap on the subscribe button to stay notified as I explore the narrative on theology, history, philosophy, science, and the Bible. See, here's the problem. If there is no God, what basis remains for objective good or bad, right or wrong? If you'll indulge me, I'm going to take this video a little bit out of order so that we can examine some logic first and deal with some of the appeals to emotion a little later. Here's Craig's argument. If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. But objective moral values and duties do exist. Therefore, God exists. As you can see, this argument hinges on the definition and existence of objective moral values. And, if they do, establishing a causal relationship between them and God. What does it mean to have an objective moral standard? Without some objective reference point, we have no way of saying that something is really up or down. Let's take the problematic word objective out of that for a minute and repeat. Without a reference point, this astronaut in space can't tell what's up or down. Presumably, the astronaut in this scene will choose the Earth as his reference point, and presumably choose to think of North as up and South as down. Once he is chosen, he can use this reference point to objectively identify other objects as up or down in relation to the reference point. In relation to a North-oriented Earth, the circular object in this scene is objectively up. But, note that the reference point itself was chosen entirely subjectively. The astronaut could have chosen the South Pole to be up, or chose the wheel thing for his point of reference, or the moon, or the sun, or anything really. The point is that Craig is mistaken. It is not the reference point that is objective, but rather the relationship between the object and the reference point that is objective. The wheel thing is objectively up when compared to the Earth reference that was chosen entirely subjectively. Make sense? When we say an object is up, we are always actually meaning in reference to my perspective that object is up. But that level of specificity would be very cumbersome in casual conversation. And in day-to-day -day life, we have so few conversations where we don't have a common perspective on what is up that we simply drop the in reference to my perspective part for convenience. Indeed, the concept of shared perspective is so intuitive to us that most people never really stop to think about it. Because everyone we meet has chosen to agree that the ground is down, it seems to us that the ground is objectively down in all circumstances. But it should be clear by now that there is no such thing as absolute down, no version of down that is down for all perspectives. A common reference point must be first arbitrarily agreed upon to even begin to talk about up or down. It is in trying to pretend objective morals and absolute morals are the same thing that Craig manages to deliberately confuse the whole issue. God's nature provides an objective reference point for moral values. Setting aside for today the problem of how one could confidently describe God's nature before establishing that God exists, Craig is repeating his mistake. Just as the Earth in the previous space scene was not an objective reference point, but rather a subjectively selected reference point against which the astronaut could make objective comparisons, so to God, even if he exists and exhibits all the properties laid out here, would still be a subjectively selected reference point if one wanted to use him. Even though there's a minimum possible temperature at which atoms completely stop moving, so-called absolute zero degrees on the Kelvin scale, most people on Earth instead choose Celsius or Fahrenheit scales, where the meaning of zero degrees are subjectively chosen to be something else. It's the standard against which all actions and decisions are measured. It's a standard against which actions and decisions could be measured. The nature of Satan, Charles Manson, or your friend's ever-cheerful mom could also be chosen as standards. But note that Craig just described morals in terms of actions and decisions. And when it comes to evaluating actions and decisions, we rarely compare them to characters or people. Instead, we intuitively evaluate an action or decision against the desired outcome, against the goal. If I want to remain safe, it is better to keep my car on the road than to drive it off a cliff. If I want to hear a YouTube video, it is better to set my volume above zero. However, if I don't want to hear the video, setting the volume to zero is the better action. We can't evaluate an action or decision without first establishing what the goal is. But the problem is, good and bad 
right and wrong do exist. Just as Craig earlier pretended that up and down exist absolutely, but we've seen that they can exist only in relation to our reference point, so too good and bad exist only in relation to a goal. In the spectrum of possible actions or decisions, good would describe the range of those that might best accomplish the goal, and bad the spectrum of those that would least accomplish the goal. Take a game of chess, for example. The rules of the game are ultimately subjective. There's no intrinsic reason the bishop moves diagonally instead of the rook. It could have been reversed, but in order to play the game, both players agree to the same subjective rules. Once that is done, objective statements can be made. If you want to win the game, you objectively ought to protect your king from being taken. If you want to win the game, you ought to take the other player's king. However, if your goal isn't to win the game, but instead to sow chaos among your friends, you ought to flip the board up in the air, sending the pieces flying. You can't specify right and wrong without first specifying the goal. Just as our sense experience convinces us that the physical world is objectively real. It's interesting that the example used as a character falling down, when we've already discussed that objective downness exists only in relation to a subjectively chosen reference point. The feeling of absolute downness he instinctively experiences in this moment doesn't change the nature of the subjectively selected reference point it is actually based upon. Oh. Our moral experience convinces us that moral values are objectively real. Every time you say, hey, that's not fair, that's wrong, that's an injustice, you affirm your belief in the existence of objective morals. Incorrect. While it may well be that this thief feels remorse and that he is in the wrong to take the phone, there are also thieves who completely disagree that they've done anything wrong. This alone should be enough to shatter the notion that there's some absolute standard for right and wrong. No, instead what you're affirming when you cry injustice is that you have a desired set of outcomes and that some action went against your desired outcome. Just as such a high percentage of humans have agreed that the ground is down and the sky is up, that we start to think our perspective on down is correct in an absolute sense, in practice, so many humans share the same fundamental moral goals that we are similarly fooled into thinking that those goals are therefore objective without spending any time thinking about them. Among those who do think about such things, it has been observed that all decision-making motivations can be expressed in terms of reducing pain or increasing pleasure. There is some debate about whether it's one or the other, or both in combination, or if pain and pleasure are merely the opposite ends of the same spectrum. That's not important for our current discussion. For example, in the afternoon, one might decide to allow for some short-term pain in going to the gym to pursue the long-term pleasure of being healthy. That same individual on the same day might later choose the short-term pleasure of a slice of cake, even though it contributes to long-term pain. But both decisions were motivated by the desire of pleasure, avoidance of pain. If you think about it, you'll likely agree that all practical decision criteria can break down to a desire to increase pleasure or decrease pain. If you can come up with one that doesn't, please leave it in the comments. The reason actual decisions vary from person to person or moment to moment stems not from the criteria but rather the time scale considered and the scope of whose pain and pleasure are being considered. Those who consider reducing suffering over the longest time frame and over the largest group of people or creatures would be those classically considered most virtuous. Remember, for the atheist, humans are just accidents of nature, highly evolved animals. I'll ignore Craig's incendiary vocabulary for now. But yes, humans are animals. And more specifically, we are in a class of animals that can be called social species. Just like bats, lions, wolves, ants, and many others, humans gained evolutionary survival advantage by working cooperatively. Within a social species, where cooperation is key to survival, Empathy and altruism are valuable traits to bring to the tribe. At its base, empathy is basically recognition of how you would like to be treated if you were in someone else's position. A monkey who doesn't want to be shoved off a tree will recognize that other monkeys likely don't want to be shoved off either. Altruism is an extension of empathy, when an individual makes choices to benefit others at a personal detriment. Everyone in the hyena pack gets a share of the kill, not just those who made this final kill. Again, at its base, this behavior is strategic selfishness, a literal you-scratch-my-back-I'll-scratch-yours scenario. In a social species, individuals who exhibit empathy and altruism are more included and welcome in the group, thereby increasing their likelihood of securing a mate, thus passing along the traits of empathy and altruism more often to future generations. In fact, brain scan studies show that private acts of charity and acts to boost one's own social standing both trigger the pleasure center and reward circuit of the brain. We have evolved such that being a positively impact member of our tribe is a direct, literal biochemical increase of our own pleasure. 
even our most altruistic acts have a selfish element. We feel good. So, because we are a social species, when we make decisions or take actions based on reducing pain or increasing pleasure, we necessarily consider the pain and pleasure of others as well. The weight that we give to the pain or pleasure of others versus our own pain or pleasure in any given decision is also a spectrum. Some decisions end up being more selfish than others, but the impact to others is generally at least a consideration. Atheism fails to provide a foundation for the moral reality every one of us experiences every day. Okay, I think we're finally ready to lay this out. 1. Morality is evaluation of the benefit of a set of actions and decisions. 2. When compared to a selected and agreed upon goal, actions and decisions can be evaluated objectively. 3. Biologically, the goals of conscious creatures are decreasing pain and increasing pleasure. 4. Within a social species, the pain and pleasure of the group is considered alongside the pain and pleasure of the individual. 5. Humans are a social species. 6. For humans, morality is evaluating actions and decisions in relation to the goal of decreasing pain and increasing pleasure of the group. So, murder, theft, dishonesty, these are all actions objectively against the goal of decreasing suffering. This is a foundation that fully explains the moral reality people experience every day. And look, no god was needed to arrive at these conclusions. Only biology. If morality is indeed accounted for entirely by biology and sociology, does God actually even add anything to the moral question? Occam's razor would say no. God has expressed his moral nature to us as commands. These provide the basis for moral duties. If your moral system, your evaluation of the fitness of actions and decisions, is based on a list of commands, then you're not going to be well equipped to evaluate the moral choices of new situations, like stem cell research, gene editing, or pop-up ad blockers, nor the subtleties of some nuanced situations, like stealing bread to feed your starving family. And with this command approach, you also leave yourself open to errors of interpretation. Some God followers believe the command that homosexuals are abominations, where other God followers allow gay pastors. Some say divorce is immoral, others that it's fine. These commands don't add clarity. Most Christians would have to admit that they allow their biological reduced suffering morality to override God commandments when the two are in conflict. In Matthew 15:4, Jesus affirms the command that anyone who curses their father or mother should be put to death. Despite this, Christian parents don't kill disrespectful children. They rationalize away this plain reading because their personal morality prevents them from accepting it. In practice, most believers are more moral than the commands of the Bible. We're well aware that child abuse, racial discrimination, and terrorism are wrong. For everybody. Always. Strange, then, that the Bible specifically commands to beat children with rods provide supremacist ammunition by affirming that God has ordained ruling classes to wield power over the souls of others, and God himself commanded a number of genocides, including innocent bystanders. How can Craig say that these things were always wrong if God commanded them at one point? Is this just a personal preference or opinion? Proponents of the moral argument for God always pull out the most hyperbolic, extreme examples to attempt to illustrate their point. But asking if torturing babies for fun can be labeled absolutely wrong is purely an appeal to emotion. The fact that a horrific act would run counter to nearly every conceivable moral goal doesn't make it an absolute wrong. Even this unthinkable thing must first be evaluated against the goal to be deemed right or wrong. After all, though rare, there have been people in history who glean personal pleasure from the pain of others. Such a person would have different goals and therefore perceive morality differently. That said, with merely the base incentive for reducing pain shared by all conscious creatures, combined with even the smallest measure of empathy from one's biology, one would clearly deem torturing babies as objectively wrong even against this minimum standard. That nearly all moral frameworks share this conclusion is not a surprise. This needs no god to explain, nor do any cases involving extreme harm. Though, perhaps a god becomes more valuable in more nuanced cases? God's essential attribute of love is expressed in his command to love your neighbor as yourself. Frankly, there's a good reason most Christians default to this single principle. It's at least a principle. A goal. Something you can evaluate an infinite number of potential decisions or actions against. You'd never decide that eating shellfish or wearing mixed fabrics or imposing marriage ideals or taking a day off work were moral or immoral actions if this one love-your-neighbor principle was all you had. You need the weird list of commands for that. 
Now, love your neighbor as your neighbor wants to be loved would be a slight improvement, but that's just getting picky. The point is that this so-called command is merely a rephrasing of the goal to minimize pain and maximize pleasure in the context of your tribe. The very principle we've established that our biology and sociology dictates. We don't need God for it. Putting it in the mouth of Jesus added nothing. This command provides a foundation upon which we can affirm the objective goodness of generosity, self-sacrifice, and equality. Generosity has the same definition as biological altruism. To make a choice to benefit another at personal detriment. This both increases the pleasure of the tribe, as well as providing a good feeling for the individual. Self-sacrifice has the same definition as generosity, and equality is empathy for all. Again, explained fully by biology. And we can condemn as objectively evil, greed. Greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Abuse and discrimination. These are merely the opposite of altruism and empathy, so definitionally run counter to the goal of minimizing harm, at least at the level of the tribe. There will always be some who choose personal pleasure over the pleasure of the tribe, but too many of those and the tribe fails. It's not a long-term strategy for any group. Let's look at that argument one more time. It's a moral argument for the existence of God. If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. I think we've shown that the moral values and duties against which we evaluate actions and decisions are always a subjectively selected goal, whether or not God exists. Even with a God, another reference point could be chosen. But objective moral values and duties do exist. Well, we've established that an action or decision can be objectively harmful or beneficial in relation to a selected goal. Nowhere did we establish that there is an absolute definitive goal to select, which is what Craig means when he says objective moral duty. He's deliberately using similar but different language here to confuse his audience with word games. Actions can be objectively evaluated against the subject of goal. Goal selection is necessarily subjective. It's only the fact that most humans happen to carry similar goals that we have this illusion of objectivity that they play upon. Therefore, God exists. Well, the first two premises are wrong, so I guess the jury's still out on God. Tap the circle to subscribe if you want to see if William Lane Craig has better luck next time. Then tap on the playlist to review his other failed attempts. See you there.